Hi, so I'm working on a number of projects that are bringing automated vehicles, self-driving cars, to our roads. And there are many reasons why I think this is going to be hugely beneficial and transformational in the way we move people, goods, and services around the world. Now, two of those reasons relate to this statistic, 95%. Firstly, safety. 1.2 million people around the world lose their lives each year on our roads. Ten times that number suffer serious life-changing injuries. Now, we know that in 95% of those collisions, human error is a contributory factor. And in the overwhelming majority, it's the primary cause. Automation of the driving task is directly addressing that human error factor as a cause of accidents on the road. The second point is parking. We know that a typical vehicle spends, on average, 95% of its life parked, static, doing nothing. This in itself is a form of pollution, never mind all the infrastructure we allocate for parking facilities. Wouldn't it be better if many of us could use shared automated vehicles that, when they've completed our journey, could go off and serve someone else's mobility needs? So I'm convinced about the benefits of automated vehicles. And there are lots of technical and regulatory challenges to overcome. But we, what we must also consider are the potential psychological hurdles to the introduction of automated vehicles. What qualifies me to say that? Well, I did my degree in psychology, and I did my PhD in how people catch. How do people use the visual information available in the flight of a ball to get from where they are to where they need to be in order to make that catch? The figures on the screen are from a study we had published in Nature on this very topic. Now, having worked in this area, I wanted to apply the skills that I'd learned in an area about which I was really passionate and that had a genuine benefit to society. So, driving being primarily a visual task, I wanted to work in road safety. And that took me to TRL, the Transport Research Laboratory, where I used this system, our DigiCar Driving Simulator, and I did a huge number of studies looking at the effects of fatigue, of alcohol, of drugs, of distraction on our ability to drive. And when you see the terrible consequences that these impairing agents have on our ability to drive, you start to think, well, maybe technology should be helping us. Can't the vehicles take care of us better than we can take care of ourselves? So I really started to push automation up the research agenda at TRL. Now, I wasn't the only one thinking this way, and I'm sure many of you will recognize this as the current version of the Google car. It has that spinning laser sensor on its roof, a number of other sensors dotted around the bodywork, and this vehicle and ones like it in the US have amassed well over a million miles of automated driving on the streets of California and Texas. But this wasn't their first automated vehicle. When they announced they were working on this project, they were using this. It's a second-generation Toyota Prius. And like its younger sibling, it has that spinning laser sensor on its roof, a number of other sensors dotted around, and again, a self-driving car. But this wasn't the first automated vehicle. Back in the 1950s, TRL had this, a standard Vanguard with a spinning radar sensor on its roof, and with some rudimentary control interactions, it was capable of self-driving. It could follow a route, it could avoid obstacles, it could only do it at significantly less than walking pace, but it was a start along this road. Now, in the 60s, we had a different approach. We had this beautiful, beautiful Citroen DS, and on its front bumper, there's an electric coil at each side. And those coils enable the vehicle to detect an electric cable buried in the road. And the signal from those coils is fed back to the steering mechanism so that the vehicle genuinely follows that electric cable. And with a cruise control system, it becomes a self-driving car. This one was tested up to 80 miles per hour. It was very smooth, it was very accurate. It even worked on heavily snow-laden roads. 
Really, it was the practicality of digging up all our roads to lay electric cables for vehicles to follow that meant this concept never got much further than the TRL test track. However, in the last couple of years, we've revisited this concept of electric cables in the road, not for vehicle guidance, but for vehicle charging. One of the biggest barriers to the adoption of electric vehicles is range anxiety, the fear that your vehicle will run out of charge before you get to your destination. If your vehicle can collect charge from the road as it drives, it would really tackle that issue of range anxiety. This is a concept of dynamic wireless power transfer, and we're looking to see if that can help reduce pollution from petrol and diesel engines. But coming back to automation, we can't test vehicles in the standard traditional way using simple sterile test track environments. We need to get vehicles out and amongst all the complexity that we see in our urban environments. To do that, TRL has created the UK Smart Mobility Living Lab. This is the use of the Royal Borough of Greenwich as a test environment for smart mobility concepts, connected automated vehicles. Organisations can bring them for test with the support of TRL, with the support of the local authority, to see how they really work in and amongst all that urban complexity. We can see how they work with buses, with taxis, with pedestrians, with cyclists, with tube trains, with overground trains, even a cable car and a river bus. How do automated vehicles fit into that urban mobility landscape, making mobility better for everyone? Now, one of the projects being delivered in the Living Lab is this one. It's called Gateway. And in Gateway projects, we're going to be testing three different types of automated vehicle. One of them is this passenger shuttle. And what we want to do is learn how the public come to trust and accept these vehicles working amongst us. The shuttle vehicle is capable of carrying six passengers, or four with a wheelchair, and it drives for itself. It's going to be tested on the Greenwich Peninsula later this year. Now, I mentioned those spinning laser sensors on the roofs of the Google car. Well, what those lasers create is a 3D point cloud database. And that's what's being shown here. The vehicle is being, is, it's an illustration of the vehicle driving through one of these 3D point cloud databases. And with the shuttle vehicle's cameras and sensors, it understands where it is and how it needs to move in order to complete its journey. It also understands the presence of pedestrians, of cyclists, of other vehicles. And with its software, it can make predictions about the movement of those other actors and adjust its behavior accordingly. It's very safe, it's very comfortable, it's very flexible. You can summon it with a uh, smartphone app and then inform it where you'd like to go using that same device. So really looking forward to testing that this uh, summer with a range of different participants and see if they love it, do they hate it, do they like it, do they want it changed? What's going to be their reaction to these vehicles operating in our urban environments? Now, a second project being delivered within the Living Lab is this one, Move UK. And this is a very different project. We'll have five cars, regular cars, that are fitted with the very latest automation systems. And over the course of three years, they will be driven by human drivers in and around the city. What we're doing in this project is collecting a huge amount of data that will enable us to compare how the human driver behaved with how those automation systems would have controlled the vehicle in those very same scenarios. We want to understand why at a particular roundabout did the human driver choose to go when the automation systems would have waited. Using this database, we'll be able to accelerate the development and validation of automation systems so that we can be sure that they work safely and effectively in our busy urban environments. Now, one of the questions that's often posed of automated vehicles is what will they do in an unavoidable crash? Would they swerve to the left into the path of an oncoming truck, killing the occupants? Or would they swerve to the right, saving the occupants, but killing some pedestrians at the side of the road? Now, there's a couple of reasons why I think this isn't quite as big a problem as it's often made out to be. The first one is that these vehicles will be risk averse. When there's uncertainty in the environment, they will be cautious. They will slow down, they will stop. So they'll be many times less likely to encounter these unavoidable crash situations. The second reason is data. 
These crashes sadly will continue to happen. However, we'll have a huge amount of data from the sensor systems on these vehicles that help us to understand why the crash occurred. Did the vehicle behave as we expected? Could it have done things differently that would have meant the crash could have been avoided? The learning from that data can be cascaded down to all the vehicles in the fleet. All the vehicles operating the software will learn from the mistakes of others. So I think very quickly we'll get to a state of optimized driving behavior from these automated vehicles. But there's a long history of human operators interacting with automation systems. From the aviation sector, we've had autopilot systems for decades. This is Eastern Airlines Flight 401, a Lockheed TriStar. And in 1972, this aircraft was on final approach to its destination airport in Florida. The pilots lowered the undercarriage, ready for landing, but noticed that the indicator in the cockpit was telling them the nose wheel had not deployed correctly. So while they worked on the problem, fearing that the aircraft would crash land, they put the aircraft into autopilot. Unfortunately, they put the aircraft into a mode of autopilot that maintained a continuous rate of descent rather than a constant altitude. It was dark, they didn't notice until it was too late, and the aircraft crashed into the Florida Everglades with the loss of 101 lives. Now, the crash investigators determined that the nose wheel had in fact deployed correctly, and it was the bulb of the indicator in the cockpit that had failed. And what does this tell us about how human operators should interact with automation systems in cars where responsibility for driving will be shared between a human driver and the automation systems? The drivers will have to understand how and when it will be safe to deploy these automation systems. They'll need to understand the capabilities of these automation systems and then how and when control will be returned back to the driver when the automation systems cease to work. It's going to be a huge human factors challenge to make this work, and we're working really hard on it. A second example is this. This is Asiana Airlines Flight 214 from 2013. It's a Boeing 777, and on its approach to its destination airport in Korea, this aircraft, the, the airport, uh, its automatic landing system wasn't working, so the pilots had to perform a manual landing on a foggy day. As you can probably guess, they didn't do a, such a good job. And the aircraft hit a seawall at the near end of the runway. It wasn't a catastrophic crash, but there were fatalities. Now, the crash investigators in this case determined that it was pilot error that had caused the crash, with the claim that the pilots had become too dependent on these automated landing systems. They'd lost the skills necessary to safely land the aircraft. So I have a concern that with automated cars, with the automation systems responsible for detecting and responding to those hazards, that we'll lose that vital skill that we have in detecting hazards, keeping us safe on the road, so that when we're in control of the vehicle, we won't be as safe as we were. 507 billion dollars. It's a big number. This is the annual productivity benefit, it has been estimated by one of the major consultancies that the widespread deployment of automated vehicles in the US could achieve by freeing drivers from that time spent driving their cars for other productive tasks. Now, I don't know if you've seen pictures of any concepts of automated vehicles, but you'll often see people sat not facing in the direction of travel of the vehicle. They might be looking down, reading a magazine, reading a book, using a portable device. That, to me, sounds like the perfect recipe for motion sickness. So the extent to which we can genuinely be productive in cars is questionable. It's not like riding in a train. The acceleration forces will be very different. The radius of the curves that you experience will be much tighter. Whether people genuinely will be comfortable working in complete car journeys is an open question. I think it's uh, unlikely. Now, there are many other challenges that we face to the introduction of automated vehicles on our roads. 
I've listed some on the screen. I don't for one second underestimate the enormity of the task that we have in making this happen. But I return to that point of safety. 1.2 million people losing their lives on our road each year. One every 26 seconds. More than 40 just in the time I've been speaking. You know, I put myself in the shoes of a parent who's lost their child to the actions of a drunk, fatigued, distracted driver. That's unacceptable. When will it become unethical for us not to introduce automated vehicles? We're working very hard to make it happen. There are lots of challenges ahead. Some of them are between our ears as well as on the roads. Thank you.